Good morning. We look today at chapter 7 of Romans, and Paul has been talking about the law of God and sin and how sin equals death and, you know, God equals life, Jesus equals life, and we're sanctified, we're set apart, we're made right, you know, and everything that way. And Paul starts chapter 7 with that uh, he says, I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only during the person's lifetime. So he's saying that, I mean, well, and then he goes on to say, you know, if a, a man and woman marry and one or the other dies, then the other, the, the surviving one can remarry and not be committing adultery because the, the the union is done, you know, the, the person is dead, so the, the law of adultery is is no longer in effect because the one person has died that way. Um, and I think also we can take that a little bit further and, you know, like, you know, once a person has died, I mean, the, the, there, there isn't anything that you and I can do for a person who has already died. I mean, that person's salvation, that person's forgiveness is dependent upon that person. It's just, I mean, I can't be saved by my mom's faith, by my wife's faith, by my kid's faith. I can only be saved by my own faith. And I can't purchase someone else's way into heaven, no matter what I do either. And so once a person dies, we are dead to the law, and then we are very dependent upon Christ and upon our relationship, our faith in Christ Jesus. And he doesn't really go on to talk a lot about that in here, but I mean, we we read, you know, a couple of days ago, uh, you know, that if, if we have been baptized with Christ into a death like his, we have certainly been baptized into a life like his. So we are dead to sin, we are alive in Christ. So when we die, we are no longer subject to the law because Jesus has taken care of that. I mean, we are then, we're then in God's care and God's keeping. And, and it, it's, it's as hard as that. It's as simple as that. And, you know, he says, you have died to the law through the body of Christ in verse 4. It, it doesn't mean that we don't have to obey the law. It means that since, because the fact that we have forgiveness in Jesus Christ, the law doesn't have the hold over us. The law still regulates how we live. It shows us the right way to live. It shows us the need for a Savior. It shows us our faults. It points out that we are sinful human beings in need of a Savior. But it doesn't separate us from God. The law no longer separates us from God because Jesus has come and intervened in there. Jesus has he says, I have not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. He says that in John chapter 3, you know, that, you know, that they, they mean, he is here for that purpose, to fulfill the law for you and for me, because we cannot do it ourselves. You know, and, you know, it says, Paul writes that to, to, that we may belong to another, we belong to him, the one who has been raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. And, and, he says in verse 7, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known my sin. And, and that's very true. I mean, if there, wasn't, if there weren't laws, we wouldn't know that some certain behavior was sinful. But the law is written upon our hearts. I mean, that's what God says back in Jeremiah. I will write your words upon your, I will write my words upon your heart. No one will need to teach you anymore because you will know. And that's part of what is our conscience. I truly believe that, that the laws of God are written in our conscience. You know, in Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, God says, I will make a new covenant with you. And the new covenant comes to us in Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that law is, is written in our hearts so we know what sin is. We know the need of a Savior. And, and this knowing that we are sin, sinful people, drives us to Christ. Our, our sin, the law, Again, points out our need for a savior. It shows us that we are helpless on our own. Verse 11, he says, for sin seizing an opportunity of the commandment deceived me and it killed me. Just like, I mean, what happened to Eve and Adam? You know, did God really say you would die? Oh, you won't die. You know, sin deceived them. The spirit deceived Eve and Adam. They ate of that fruit of the forbidden tree. And 
you know, it's, it's deception. And there is so much deception in the world today, and often we deceive ourselves, you know. We say, oh, that's, you know, that's not really sinning. You know, that's not really doing whatever it is. But yes, it is. You know, most of the time, yes, it is, you know. And, you know, if, if we think it might be and we try to make excuses for it, sin is deceiving us. One thing sin can't deceive us of is of our need for a Savior. If we are honest with each other and confess and know that we are sinners. I mean, there is no deception there. I mean, I know that I am a sinner. Uh, Satan can't deceive me and, and tell me that I'm not a sinner. I mean, he will never, Satan will never, ever convince me that I'm not a sinner in need of a Savior. I hope you can say the same. Then we get on to verse 15. Paul says, I do not understand my own actions. Talking about inner conflict. You know, talking, he says... I do the things I don't want to do, and the things that I want to do, I don't do. I mean, it's sometimes you got to read that a couple times to get it in your head, but he's saying that, you know, I know I shouldn't do this, but that's what I do. And the thing that I know I should do, I, I, I don't do, you know. And so we have this inner conflict of, of, our, of our mind, our, our conscience, knowing what the law is, knowing what we shouldn't do, but the sinful flesh of who we are continues to sin. I mean, we know what a sin is, but we continue to do it. And that's what Paul says, you know. He says, I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I do not want, that's what I do. He says, bunk, bunk me across the head and tell me what an idiot I am. I know, you know. He says, no, if I do what I don't want, it's no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. And that's a very true statement. And we can't use that as a scapegoat, though, saying, well, sin made me do it. The devil made me do it. Well, yeah, I mean, that's very true. The devil made me do it. The devil made us sin. It doesn't excuse our behavior because we know what the sin is, right? We know what the sin is. And, and, and it is our own sinful nature that works against us. And this is what Paul is talking about here. It's our own sinful nature, this inner conflict, this struggle that goes on within us between our, between our knowledge of good and evil, between our knowledge of what we know we should do and we know we shouldn't do. You know, there's this inner conflict that goes on within us. And Paul is very aware of that. And, and you know, he's, he talks about that. When I want to do good, evil lies close at hand. He says that in verse 21. When I want to do good, evil lies close at hand. It's reflective of the, if we build a church on the corner, Satan builds a chapel across the street. And not to say that chapels are bad things, anything, right? but you know, when we construct something for God, when we, when we do something within our hearts, within our minds, when we do something that we know is right and good, Satan is there to tempt us. I mean, and just... I mean, Satan never gives up on us. I mean, you can look at the very best person that you can think of. A person who is, you've never heard swear, you've never seen him do anything wrong. You can look at any person around and you know that Satan is working on them. The very best person you know, Satan is working harder on them than he is on somebody that's just lost completely into their sin. I mean, he doesn't have to work so hard on somebody that's completely lost in sin. So Satan works hard on those people that, that, that seem like they just don't ever do anything wrong. And why don't they do things wrong? Because they have the love of God in their hearts, because they rely on the strength of Jesus, because, because they work so hard to do it, to do the right thing. It doesn't mean they're not tempted. It doesn't mean that they're not hurting. It doesn't mean that Satan's not working on them. And, and we have to remember that. And, and we think about this Paul who's writing these letters, who is a devout Jew, he was a Pharisee, and now he's one of the most outspoken Christians there is. In verse 24, he says, Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Christ Jesus my Lord. Despair, wretched man that I am, and relief. Who will rescue me? Jesus Christ my Lord. And we can each and every one of us say that. Wretched person that I am. I know that I can't do right. I know that I do more wrong than I want to. I know that life is tough. I have despair. But the relief comes in knowing Jesus as our Lord and Savior. 
So he ends this chapter with, So then with my mind I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh I am a slave to sin. And it's that inner struggle, that inner conflict, that despair, that relief, that, that struggle that goes on each and every day between right and wrong, between good and evil. And, and Paul is very willing to admit that, you know, that it goes on within him. And, you know, it's just, it points us to that need for our Savior, this, this, this law of God and, and the knowledge of the sin that we have. And, and I think we can all, each and every one of us, echo Paul's words, wretched, wretched person that I am, all the sin that I have, what am I to do but to rely, to rely on Jesus Christ our Lord.